So we'll take a little deeper look at ionization energy. When we talk about ionization energy, the trend we really teach you is for the first ionization energy. We'll talk about what that means in a sec, but Bree, do you remember what ionization energy meant again? Good. Energy to remove an electron. And again, an electron is negative, the nucleus is positive. An electron wants to be part of an atom. If you remove that electron, it's going to cost energy to pull it away from where it wants to be. And so this is typically endothermic for ionization energy. And so if you look, the trend, again, really is opposite. It goes all the way to the upper right-hand corner to helium, in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table. It's exactly opposite of what we saw for atomic radius. And this makes sense. Notice francium's outermost electron, big fat francium. Its outermost electron is way far away from the nucleus, and its effective nuclear charge is only plus one. And so that electron is not very attracted to its nucleus. So if I want to remove it, it's not going to be all that difficult. It'll cost me a little, but it's not going to cost me a lot. On the other hand, the noble gases like helium, especially helium, the noble gases have a plus eight effective nuclear charge holding in their outermost electrons. And in the case of helium, helium is really small, and so the electron is really close to that nucleus. And so it's highly, highly, highly attracted. And so if you want to remove it, it's going to cost a lot of energy. And so the general trend says, as you get a higher effective nuclear charge, it's harder to remove one. As they get smaller, they're closer to the nucleus, and it's harder to remove one. And so that's why the trends are exactly opposite of what we saw for atomic radius, which totally makes sense. OK, so we, treat, we teach you this trend. Again, this is really for the first ionization energy. And if I say that there's the first ionization energy, what, might, what assumption might you make? There's a second or a third or a fourth, and that's totally true. This is the energy to remove the first electron. But there are also trends associated with removing the second one or the third one. We call them successive ionization energies. So if you were to look at something, say, like boron, if you remove an electron from boron, that would look like this. You take away its electron, and now what charge will it have? Plus one, and there's the electron it lost. OK, that would be the first ionization energy. But what if I then took that boron ion and I removed another electron? What charge would it have now? And what if that would be the second ionization energy? And then what if I took that ion and removed another electron? What charge now? Awesome. That would be the third ionization energy. And then what if finally, this is going somewhere, by the way, I took another one away. And that would be what we call the fourth ionization energy. Cool. And if we look, we should expect something here. As I take away an electron and it now becomes a cation, what happens to the size of the boron? It gets smaller. And so if I want to pull another electron out because it got smaller, what is that going to do to how much energy it takes to remove another one? It's going to take more energy. Now, a lot more will go there in a sec, but it will take significantly more. What significant means we'll see in a sec. And because it now gets even smaller, then if I want to pull out another electron, it gets even more difficult. And it gets even more difficult. So ionization energies always increase as you go from first to second to third to fourth. So, but what we're going to find out with boron is that as we go from first to second, it gets a fair amount higher. As we go from second to third, it gets a fair amount higher again. As we go from third to fourth, though, it gets a ton higher. Not just like a fair amount, a lot, 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 lot more higher, if I want to go with bad grammar there. So it gets significantly higher. Why? Well, if we look at boron, plain old original boron here is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. Why is it so much more difficult to pull off a fourth electron? Good. Once I've pulled off three electrons, I've pulled off all three of the valence. If I want to pull off a fourth electron, though, that's going to be a core electron. And those are much more difficult to remove. And so you typically see this big jump. If we actually plotted this, and so we plotted 
you know, the ionization energy of boron. And we kind of started with our first and our second, third, fourth. And we'd see this gradual upward trend. And these could go from like 1,000 to 2,000 to 3,000 or something like that. It looks pretty linear. And all of a sudden, you get a huge jump in ionization energy. And from a graph like this, you might be like, oh, yeah, I see this. That means these were valence. So, and the, where I got the big jump, this guy must have been a core electron. And so I could give you a graph like this, and I could say, what element could this be? And what you're supposed to get from the graph is how many valence electrons that atom had. Who else besides boron has three valence electrons? Well, anybody in that column, right? Boron or aluminum and on and on down, down the column. Any group three element right there could have qualified if I'd given you this graph and said, who is it? The other way you might see this show up is if I asked you to give me an element who has a really high second ionization energy. Well, if I want an element who has the highest second ionization energy, what can you imply? First. Metal, good. First, first, first. For, first metal. yeah, the alkali metals. Why the alkali metals? So we have one valence electron. Awesome, they only have one valence electron. And so by the time you pull out one, when you go to pull out the second one for alkali metals, you're gonna have to take a core electron. And so you'd be looking totally for one of the alkali metals as your answer, if you were looking for the highest second ionization energy. Also a really common question on the test. So we love doing this to you in chemistry. We'll teach you a rule or a trend, and then we'll go back and teach you the exceptions. So let's talk about the exceptions. So I gave you a graph on your sheet to kind of show you where the exceptions lie. So, but if we look at the entire period two elements, starting with lithium and working our way all the way across to neon. What you'll find out is that if you look at the first ionization energy, and that's the one the trend is really for again, that you'll find that, yeah, lithium is the lowest, and neon over here is definitely the highest. Okay, so it kind of follows the trend. We do expect it to across a row to keep increasing. But what we'll find out is there are a couple hiccups in the trend. As we go to, say, beryllium, and I'm gonna skip boron for a second, we go to carbon, on to nitrogen, I'm gonna skip oxygen for a second, and we go to fluorine, and we see this upward trend. What we're gonna find, though, is that we'll find that beryllium's a little higher, a little harder to move one, and boron is a little easier, so that ultimately is a brief reversal of the trend. Usually, growing across, it should just be going up, but between beryllium and boron, beryllium's actually higher. And same thing we see with nitrogen compared to oxygen. Nitrogen's a little higher than we expect, and oxygen's a little lower than we expect, so, and it turns out oxygen's actually lower than nitrogen as well. So, and if we look at why this is, so if we compare Beryllium and boron. So beryllium in the valence is just 2s2. Boron in the valence is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. And so it turns out that you know we have some very stable elements that have very stable electronic configurations. Who are the most stable elements out there? Noble gases. Noble gases. They got a filled octet. And having a filled octet turns out really stable electronically, but it's not the only stable place to be. It's not just a filled octet. If you end with a filled subshell, that's not as stable as a noble gas, but it still gives it some stability. And so we look here, brilliant's like, dude, don't take one of my electrons away. I'm kind of stable, man. Don't take one of mine. And so it costs a little more energy. And boron's like, dude, if you gotta take somebody's electron, take mine. Because if you take that one, then I'd be kind of stable. And so he doesn't still want to give it away. It still costs energy. It just doesn't cost as much as it otherwise would. And as a result, it turns out it's easier to pull off boron's last electron than beryllium's. So if we compare nitrogen and oxygen as well.
So it turns out it's not just stable if you have a full subshell, but if the subshell is exactly, exactly half full. And in this case, how many electrons can a P subshell hold? Six. Six. And we see that nitrogen is exactly half full. And so nitrogen is like, don't take one of my electrons away. I'm half full right here. I'm pretty stable. Leave me alone. Whereas oxygen's like, dude, if you took one of mine, I'd kind of look like nitrogen does and be kind of happy about that. And so it's a little easier to take one from oxygen, a little more difficult to take one from nitrogen to the point where, again, we have this brief reversal of the trend. Nitrogen is higher than oxygen. And it's not just, you know, beryllium and boron. If you go down to the next row and you actually compared like magnesium and aluminum, you'd find it continues on there. Same thing, nitrogen and oxygen. If you compared phosphorus and sulfur, you'd find out phosphorus is also higher than sulfur. It doesn't go all the way down the periodic table, but you know at least goes down a couple of rows. Cool. One other thing to look at here. If we kind of look at the p orbitals and look at the electrons in the p orbitals, kind of make a little more sense of this. So with three p electrons, we put one in each orbital, right? Whereas for oxygen, you put one in each orbital, and then you're going to have to pair one up. And it doesn't really matter. I could pair it up over here first, but you know we often write left to right, so I'll pair up the left one first. And so here's the deal. Nitrogen's here like, dude, none of my electrons are paired up. That's good, because oxygen here's got a problem. How do those two electrons that live in the same orbital feel about each other? They repel each other. They're both negatively charged. They don't like each other. And oxygen's like, dude, if you take one of these away, I wouldn't have that repulsion going on. That'd be great. And again, that's another way of looking at why it's a little easier. So you might see it explained with like electron repulsions and stuff as well, if you were looking for maybe a reason. So kind of understanding the concept behind it might help you answer you know, this question a little bit different slant. So but you should know the general trend for first ionization energy. You should know the hiccups. So notice if I gave you lithium, beryllium, boron, and carbon. So, and I said, which one has the highest first ionization energy? Which one would you pick? Yeah, carbon, it's like a no-brainer. What if instead of lithium, I just went down the next one and I put nitrogen on there? Then who'd have the highest first ionization energy? Nitrogen. Then nitrogen. Well, what if I take off beryllium and I tack on oxygen? That's where you're gonna get the exception question. Nitrogen still wins, higher than oxygen. And so the general trend says one furthest to the right, but don't forget the hiccups where you might get an exception. And we love asking those questions on a test because we didn't teach you the exceptions for nothing, right?